Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We have the pleasant task tonight of talking about the Ravens offense from that win over the Commanders. Another big game for the offense, another big game for the team to beat a, a quality opponent at home. Joining me to do that is Yuri. Yuri, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ken. How are you doing? I uh, I appreciate you having me on. I uh, was on here previously with you. And, um, you know, I always, always love talking ball. Always love talking ball. All right. And uh, uh, you're you're doing a podcast now with uh, Jason of Huddle Up Films, right? Yeah. So about but every Wednesday around um, 6.15 uh, Pacific Standard, 9.15 Eastern. Uh, so weird being out here in out west mm-hmm. and the new, the new time zone. It's just. The sun's still up, and then you know, calling my dad. And he's he's like, I'm about to go to sleep. I'm like, what are you talking about? Six <laughs> fifteen. Um, but yeah, so nine fifteen every Wednesday. Me and me and Jason are on talking, talking, uh, talking football, talking Rams football. All right, very good. Uh, this is a game lived up to its hype. I think in every way. I I, I really enjoy the game, and I, I I I think it was good for the Ravens to be tested by a good young quarterback. Not that they haven't been tested by several good young quarterbacks. Something I don't like here is I really don't like how the national media characterizes the rivalry. First of all, that there is a rivalry at all. Second of all, when they call it the Battle of the Beltway, implying that there's one beltway between these two cities, there's the beltway from hell, that's 495 over there, and there's there's the perfectly reasonable good beltway of, of Baltimore that's that's a, a problem at times, but it's not have overwhelming traffic uh, you know, most of the time. Yeah, and then they also throw in the whole DMV thing. Is Baltimore part of the DMV? It's like, ah, let's just play the game. Let's just play the game. Yeah, that's uh, I, I that thing has been I, that's a little hard for people to understand. I've I've come to terms with it over a number of years. Uh, there is is one thing that comes up. I think whenever Baltimore and Washington play, is really a question of is it ever really a good thing to have a team in Washington or to have a good team in Washington or have a good rivalry with Washington. And the question is a little more murky with the NFL because with revenue sharing, you don't have the same problems you have with baseball about really fans, relative salaries of the team, and um, you know what can happen. Uh, Baltimore, you know, is sold out now, so they don't have the problem with that. But they still, if if you go to any kind of um, sweet holder level Ravens events, they'll the first thing they'll tell you is they'll be very honest. We have to be in the top half of revenue in this league to remain competitive. And we have to do all these things to get there. So the the question I would have coming out of this is, is it ever really a good thing? Is it really a good thing for the Ravens to have a competing team in Washington? And given that they have one, is it a good thing that they have a good team there potentially? I mean, that's tough because you you start thinking of those counties, uh, you know, out there closer to Washington. um, And they, I could certainly see fans being drawn those those teams out there that are those fans out there to be drawn more to the a DC team. I, I could certainly see that and have that potentially affect the Ravens revenue. But I, as long as the Ravens are in Baltimore, I, they'll always probably be in that that top uh, that top half at least. I, I I hope you're right about that. I, and I I felt very very differently about it in terms of the Orioles. By, by the way, one of the things if you if you were around for the beginning of this franchise. And I'm not sure if you were aware at the time, but in the, in the mid '90s, first of all, the NFL tried to keep Baltimore on the table for as long as possible, including not giving the team the, the expansion team to Baltimore, largely because they wanted to leverage the um, the stadium deal that was here into stadium deals for all these other uh, owners who didn't want to move. And so there was all this flirting going on with Baltimore. It was it was very unseemly. Then they didn't give Baltimore a franchise. One of the people who really, really, really didn't want to give Baltimore a franchise was Jack Kent Cook. So I'm never getting over that entirely. And so there's, there is a lot of hatred for the Redskins franchise out of that. Um, if if you didn't go through that, I, all I can say is if you wanted football back in this town, if you paid to get club seats, if you really were, were, were buying into the, to the need for football in this town – you felt really jerked around by this process and, and the, the people in DC and the owner in DC in particular had a lot to do with it. Yeah. I mean, that was all before my time. That was all before my time. So um, I, I always love hearing about stuff like this. You know, I I'm familiar with how the Ravens started and how it was a struggle to get, you know, a franchise going back in Baltimore again. But uh, in terms of the the way that it came about, that that is all before my time. So I do I do appreciate. I love hearing stuff like that. 
All right. Well, fair enough. So, so with the Orioles, their history is even longer back, and they've they've knocked out two Washington teams. The Orioles have been the more successful franchise since the Browns arrived in '54. Um, it was only set, took, took them only seven years to basically force the Senators out to move to a move to Minnesota, and then another eleven years later, they forced a move to Texas of the the second expansion Senators team. Um, and we thought we're finally done with the notion of having a competing franchise in Washington. Baltimore had a long run down to where you start running into Braves fans of, you know, fairly well populated states, total decent fan base, including all the way down into areas like Florida, where there's there's a lot of Yankees fans and, and whatnot, um, where, where they had a good, a good solid opportunity to, to get fans. And the Orioles of the 60s and 70s were outstanding. Um, got a lot of those fans, got a lot of those fans all the way down. Um, and, uh, you know, it really screwed the Orioles in when the Nationals got re- relocated here uh, and took away basically half of the of the Orioles market. And some would say the good half, you know, the richer half around the D.C. area um, that was it was, you know, creating a lot of demand for tickets was a big part of the the huge attendance boom in the 1990s. And uh, it's just very frustrating um, that they would do it again to Baltimore after twice it proved not to work. And I still feel like the the Orioles and the Nationals are in this 30 or 40 year death struggle to decide who gets this market. For sure. And, and the fact that it's so you think of some of the other population centers like New York teams being split up like New Jersey and um, the Giants and how they're split in half. New York's so big, it's, it it works. It's, it still works there, but they still have a. a you always see when the Jets and Giants are playing each other. There's still a little rivalry. The, you know, the field's cut in half, and um, but yeah, I, I, I could certainly see a place where, kind of like how you were saying with the Orioles and the Nationals going back and forth for money. If the Commanders do eventually kind of circum come back, be a better team, and some of these some of these fans that are seem seem a little. A little antsy, a little upset, a little fed up. Um, hey, I mean, you know, no better time to, to make a switch uh, than when, you know, if the teams just come right down the roads having, having right. good success. I think I think this does take time, by the way, but moving the the um, commanders out of Landover and into Northern Virginia probably will help a little bit. We'll probably get some of the uh, northern D.C. suburbs will have a little bit, very slowly growing Ravens fan base. Now, those are always fairly entrenched um, fan bases, but to the degree D.C. is a um, transient population, when they have people come into the area, you may you have an opportunity to pick up some fans and, and have them be Baltimore fans, and and that's at least exciting. But for one day anyway, big big game with uh, Jaden Daniels and obviously the the the, the Commanders. Uh, you know. I, I it, we're talking offense here. I'd say it was a great game for the Ravens taking what they were given. For sure. And <clears throat> it was it was a lot of Lamar Jackson just kind of hitting the open passes. I mean, that was probably thinking back to some of the other games in the past. Certainly one of the most like receiver separation ha- like favorite games we've had. You've also had a lot of the crossing routes to Lamar hit to Zay Flowers, all those plays, even a lot of the check downs and the screens. I mean, it was just it was just one of those games where you didn't, he didn't have to do anything crazy. He just sat sat in the pocket and delivered. Yeah, and and they the commanders gave them, uh, you know, when they when they were trying to defend the run, they gave them some fantastic man coverage opportunities against the pass, which is, you know, p- the pick your poison is a phrase that we're hearing all over town. You know, today is is really true. Is that you know they were so concerned about stopping Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson and potentially getting some people in the backfield to hurry throws. That you know they they did not have the talent in the secondary to keep up with Flowers or to in fact in this ba- game to keep up with Bateman either, and those guys really made some serious hay in some wide open spaces. For sure, and and you with, especially with Bateman, you know he's had a couple up and down games, but for him to go out there and even though the commander secondary outside of Chin, in my opinion, was pretty like ah like Benjamin St. Juice is all right and. Um, you know, obviously Forbes is on the bench and all the other guys they have, but to see Bateman go out there and have such a positive performance as well is very encouraging. Um, and even though he did, uh, he did have a drop, but just very, very encouraged, encouraged overall with Flowers, Bateman, um, and the the whole receiving group is a is a as a total. Yeah, it was it was certainly a good game for them. 
Um, by the way, you, you mentioned Emmanuel Forbes there, and, and he was inactive for this game. I thought this was the perfect game to get him involved, by the way. Uh, and the reason would have been you know, the normal defense played against the Ravens is a, is a very heavy zone scheme where you where you want to sit back and cover three, keep eyes on Lamar Jackson, um, maybe play a spy, lower numbers in the pass rush to try and uh, you know, keep keep control of him. Now, there are risks that go along with that, that you're going to be light in the run game and whatnot. But um, Emmanuel Forbes, this would have been a great get right game for him in terms of of, you know, making reads, coming downhill, making plays on the football. Um, now there's talk that the, the commanders may trade him, um, which to me, if he is available and the Ravens could get him at, a, at any kind of reasonable price. And I'm, I, I think I might go as high, right? He's, he's definitely damaged goods right now. He's no longer a, a first round commodity, but a fifth round pick maybe for Forbes. Yeah, that, that, that would definitely be in consideration. I was also surprised to see them put Jamin Davis, uh, their other first round pick on the bench as well. You think, Hey, Having a, having a good athlete out there to be able to play in space and make these tackles against the the, the Ravens athletes in the skill positions um, makes makes sense. But and it, with, with Forbes as well, you you would think, hey, we like you don't play man against Lamar Jackson. You play zone. Now, of course, the Commanders came out and played man, but um, you would you would assume that hey, let's let's get our athletes out in the field. Let's get our good cover coverage players out in the field, especially with zone. Um, but I also see the flip side being hey. He's light in the run. Like he's, <laughs> you don't want their kind of coming downhill. Forbes is going to be a, a moving, a moving piece. Yeah, and this is one of the advantages the defense has is since they react second to personnel. At least from a personnel standpoint, they wouldn't have been able to react to Forbes being on the field with different heavier personnel. So you don't get to insert Ricard because you see Forbes on the field. It's it's a case of they see you without Ricard and they're able to put Forbes on the field kind of thing, or they see Justice Hill on the field, they're able to put Forbes in. Um, so it was it, it, it was an interesting thing. It just what um, uh, uh, Cordell Woodland said, and he's a he's a, a Commanders fan. Is he just thinks the organization is done with him? And I, I just I find that incredible that you know one year and five games later after you draft one of the greatest interceptors college football has ever seen that you just can't figure out how to make him right. And and one of the points he makes is, you know, it's the previous administration's decision. It's not ours. So it's easier to part ways with it. On the other hand, it's your fan base's draft capital. And when you, when you middle finger them by saying, Hey, we're, we're, we're moving on from Forbes. I think you're, you're taking a, um, a, a potentially more dangerous road. Yeah. And the spend what was he the 16th overall pick in, in that draft or the, I think that's right. Yeah. The Ravens didn't have a chance at him. I think, I think you're right. It was maybe 16, 18, whatever it was. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you know, you gotta, you gotta get him out there, at least get him some experience. And Hey, if he plays, you know, 15, 20 snaps a game, it, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, I don't think he's that much of a detriment to you. Now, of course the week last year, it was pretty bad, but um, it, it's, it's unfortunate to see, because that is the reality of the modern NFL is, Players are being given up on way sooner, uh, and a lot of politics go into the way that players are, you know, started and snap share and all that stuff. And you'd assume someone with a first round pedigree would probably get a little more, a little more run. Uh, but hey, <laughs> one year and five games, and he's 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 moving on. Yeah, that's uh, that's an odd situation, anyway. All right, so the Ravens now the betting favorite to win the AFC North. That's been the case actually since. Uh, they were 0-2. They were 0-2, and, and they were still the favorites to win the North. But now they're 4-2, and and they have an implied odds of 72.8% to win the North, and that's taking the juice out of what is the best available line on each of the four teams. So, for instance, you can get 150-1 to now on the Browns. I think it's 5.5-1 to on the Steelers. Actually, 4.5-1, to one, sorry, 4.5-1 on the, on the Steelers, and about 8.5-1 to one on the Bengals. So... Um, Bengals are not completely dead this week. Definitely, even though the Ravens beat the Commanders at home, I think it was a it was maybe a more important win for both the Steelers and the and the Bengals in terms of staying in the race. So their their, their chances to win it didn't go up very much. Do, do you think that the betting public has a reasonable handle on who's going to win the North, or do you think that the betting public is is and 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 the line that is supposed to be reflecting their action is just as foolish as anybody? They have, they have a pretty good handle in, in in the way that like the Steelers they're they're switching quarterbacks here week six even though they have four wins 
they're switching quarterbacks. So clearly, they don't have they didn't have confidence in Fields. Now they're going back. They're going over to Russ, and then the Browns are that's over. That that's that's mm-hmm. that's just completely over. And the Bengals. I mean, the Bengals could certainly claw the way back, but they're already four four in the hole in terms of losses. Um, and the way that that I see the rest of our schedule playing out, and the rest of their schedule playing out. There's not, I don't I don't think there's a place where they're going to enter the Ravens and Bengals win loss record is going to intersect to the point where that second game we play against them is going to matter a whole bunch in terms of the divisional win. So hope you're right. Yeah, it, I think I think the Ravens the Ravens have a pretty good pretty good handle on things, and so does the betting market. All right. Um, now you mentioned the Browns, so let's I guess we'll talk a little bit about the Amari Cooper trade that happened today. We're recording this on on uh, Tuesday night. And Amari Cooper just got dealt to the Bills for it looks like a third and a seventh, or there's a third and a seventh that Cleveland gets. There may be a pick returned. Um, good deal for I, I mean, let me start that I don't think it does anything cap wise for the Browns. They're getting a big guy out, but he's he's only got a salary of about a million and a little bit. So for the rest of the year, it's maybe eight hundred thousand dollars that that they still owe him on this year's contract because they've they've prorated. Sorry, not prorated. They've um, paid everybody their entire salary as bonus that makes any kind of serious money on the Browns and allowed that to be play out as uh, prorated over not only the remainder of the years, but void years in most cases on these contracts. So to, to even trade Cooper, they had to use up about half of their available cap space for this year. They had about 44 million and it was about 22 million in immediate um, accelerated bonuses they had to pay out. To me, that, that's waving the white flag right there to any yep. any any seriousness they had this year. Like, hey, let's make a big trade, anything like that. There's the white flag, uh, the proverbial white flag. But Amari Cooper to the Bills. So I saw I saw that ESPN said that Cooper was like the worst rated receiver in the league. And I'm like, I don't buy that. I don't I don't think I don't I don't buy that. Uh, for a third to seventh, a little a little higher for Amari Cooper in in, in 2024 than I would expect. For the Bills, they needed it. They really did need it. They needed a separator, someone that could they could win off the line of scrimmage. They just don't have that on the outside right now. Um, so I think it was a fair trade for the Bills in in, in a sense. They they had to make a move. It was, it was pretty desperate. For the Browns, it's it's just a white flag in my opinion. Yeah, I I actually thought they got pretty good value in terms of what they got. I mean, I, I, Amari Cooper. Let's let's look at the, the the hardest facts of all. He's thirty years old, and I know Deshaun Watson stone him the football, but he's got four point seven yards per target, and it's not a small number of targets. He's been targeted fifty three times this year, so that's almost ten times a game, and you're not doing anything with those opportunities. Now, admittedly, there's all kinds of data out there, and I'll let you search for it yourself on how inaccurate the balls thrown to have been. That's still terrible, terrible results. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he'll be better with Buffalo. Uh, I'm, I'm really shocked that they got as much as they did. If, if I were the Browns, I probably would have traded him for less. But the Browns, I think, are doing the only – they're taking the only course available to them in trying to stockpile some draft capital at this point. Um, they, I, I think you're right in terms of their, they're waving the red flag on, on the Watson deal specifically, which really means – they may as well accumulate draft capital over the next three drafts. Um, in fact, they're they're a they're kind of an ideal team, I would think, to accept future draft picks that are fully discounted for the normal value. So, if if they said if somebody offers them a third this year for Amari Cooper, this they, they might say, well, how about a second in 2026 instead? And I I think that you know might be a good trade for a team like the Browns that probably won't contend in 25. Agreed, and you could see. Something similar play out for for someone like Zadarius on the on their roster. Someone mm-hmm. that probably wants to play at least somewhere contending, and you could you could see a fourth and twenty twenty six be actually you know offered uh, instead of the twenty twenty five fifth. So certainly, there's ton of tons of players in that roster that are on that cusp of uh, of of being flipped for. To your point probably higher draft capital than in later years. Yeah. Well, this, this is, this is really interesting because I, I have to, every time the Browns are going to get rid of a player or could get rid of a player, I have to look at it and see, can they actually afford to get rid of him given their remaining cap? Cause they almost have no new cap to be created. There's like literally no one on their team that they can cut and create cap room for at this point. It's all been done already, but Zedarius, they actually can trade. They have about 22 million left, I believe under cap. And they have they they would have to take on fourteen million more in dead money and in void years, prorated bonuses, all that crap that they'd have to accelerate. 
um, they have to take about 14.2 million in dead money right now. So that might even be a little less because we're six weeks into the season. So maybe it's you know 13 million or something, but it's it's a it's uh it's still a lot of money, but it is under their number. And it tells you just the Browns really are out of options in terms of what they could do at this point. And it surprised me too that they didn't let that forty-four million dollars just roll over. And I understand making the players happy, but they're already they're already so deep in the hole and their their hands are kind of tied to what they can and can't do that I guess at this point they just gotta bite bite the bullet. Mm-hmm. It just it's a little draft capital versus versus rolling it over and having it be you know what it is next year and, and they are they're over the cap next year already so they have to roll over some or, or get it done and they only have one guy on the whole roster they can they can uh, deal with Jack Conklin they can save about eleven point seven million by cutting him next year and then, I mean you look down the whole list there isn't anybody else everybody else is already mortgaged to the hilt so uh, it's one of the worst cap situations I've ever seen the Saints have been in kind of a similar situation for a few years, but this is this is right there with it. A terrible situation. This this is worse in my and this this the Browns one is, is definitely the worst. The Saints the Saints always made it work, and hey, the Saints were like nine and eight and eight and nine flirting flirting with that for the longest time. But this this Browns team is 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 not does not look very uh, very motivated to win football games on Sundays, and the cap the cap space just compiled on top of it. Yeah, you know it, the the point you just made is really good because. This when you have a, a crap team where the front office has really botched it in terms of what's happening and and you you don't believe in your quarterback I guess is one of the biggest things that goes along with that um, you, your players start to become more mercenary in nature so they they start making business decisions about what whether they're going to play or not on a particular week what you, you need me to play on this potential four win team is that what you need me to play on this Sunday and risk my future in, in the NFL on? You, I mean. Your, your teammates end up being like that. And it doesn't take a whole lot to tip you over into uh, some really dark places when, when you get started down that. And you see it with another team like the Raiders with Devontae Adams and some yep. of the guys. And now we're about to, about to uh, bring up Devontae Adams. Is There's not a lot of buy-in on that team. I, I, yep. I think Antonio Pierce came in a little too strong, in my opinion, with the the, the strong arm and the, the old ways of doing things. And, you know, there, there. I'm sure there is some buy-in, but uh, just another team out there that looks looks a little lifeless. Yeah, I, I would agree, and it's it's not going to look good for the Ravens at the end of the season to have that loss on their record. Obviously, um, and uh, it that team has very significant issues. But it's, I, it, that I think that takes care of the Devontae Adams discussion. Let's move on. Talk some other offensive things. Um, I, I, I want to talk about the special teams first, though, because the Ravens again. Booted the ball in the end zone seven times on kickoffs. There's only one that was kind of close where the they, the commanders did actually return it out of the end zone. Um, the commanders four out of six times. I, I'm I, I like that Harbaugh is buying into the reduced variance of kicking the ball in the end zone, basically saying our defense is good enough to stop you from the thirty, and we're happy to make that exchange with you, and and we're certainly happy to take the lower injury risk. But I'm still a little concerned that they're carrying extra special teams players. And even though they had an extra elevation, they didn't get that fifth DL activated this last week. For sure. And, and they they do put a lot of emphasis on special teams. But, man, did they, did they have just like eight or nine guys solely responsible for being special team aces? And it's a little overkill. They, uh, they, they got to cut. If they're going to if they're going to go with the strategy, hey, we're just going to kick it out of bounds. And 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 save uh, we'll we'll save those five yards and, and trust our defense. Um, they 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 got to cut down on the the special team actives on on game day. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, we saw Derrick Henry, uh, you know, play a great half of football. He wasn't bad in the first half. He was okay, but a bunch of two yard gains. Uh, you know, to, to to start off the game, uh, his yards before contact number is the most incredible thing. I've seen this year. So last year he had a really terrible yards before contact number and a really low yards before contact number is almost always due to very poor offensive line play. And that, that certainly was true in Tennessee. Tennessee wasn't getting him a lot of holes, not a lot of first contact in level two opportunities. And he had 0.85 was his yards on average before contact this year, 2.51. Now, unlike, the, the offensive line is usually responsible for all the short ones. Oftentimes when you have a well-blocked play and then you have a speedy back as Henry is still, 
um, you get a lot of yards before contact tacked on on a long run like the 87 against Buffalo because that was all before contact. Um, so it, it's, it's, it is a combination of factors. It's not all Henry. It's not all the offensive line, certainly. Um, but the situation in Baltimore is so much better because he's gotten 1.74 more yards before contact. Sorry, 1.66 more yards before contact and 1.74 more yards per carry. So that's almost 100% of the difference. And and a difference difference that I'm seeing is is the Ravens are running a lot more toss with with Henry out out of under center. They're running a lot more. um, You you saw a couple of pistol pistol zone read action with with Henry. And it's just it's just it's a whole combination. Obviously, Lamar being the gravity force in the run game that he is and all the attention sometimes gets shifted to him, or at least it used to. Now with Henry, it's kind of pick your poison, like uh, like 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 Lamar likes to say. But it's it's certainly interesting to see how they scheme it because Todd Munkin is doing a, a very very good job at getting Henry, um, and this offensive line as well is is doing a great job of getting Henry not even you know touched before he he gets well past the line of scrimmage. Yeah, it's it, it is amazing because they they've switched from Roman to to Henry. Obviously, they've kept a lot of the Roman concepts. The 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 blocking scheme on the crack toss is one of the ones that is not something I remember seeing consistently with Roman. First of all, I don't think they ran it nearly as much. But second of all, the notion of of having Ricard taking the defensive end and knocking him out uh, is not something typically. And part of it was they weren't really running it under center. So they were they were running it out of the pistol, and then that that changes how you, the dynamic of how you do that. You can still toss right or left out of pistol, but they haven't run out of pistol much at all the last since 2019. Really, from 20 to 23, they really haven't run out of pistol much. They they're doing it again this year a little, um, but not much in that in that four year period in between. So I've been really impressed with the way Monken has gotten the blocking going. I don't know if there's another guy who's equally responsible for that, who's like a run game coordinator, or maybe it's Godsey is the tight ends guy who might have a hand in the, in the run game scheming, but, uh, but it's been very well done. And, and I've just been, I'm, I'm loving all of the skill position blocking that we're seeing from the Ravens. For sure. And you, you have to also toss in the, the tight ends as, as well. have have been great blocking this year. Big, big step from Isaiah likely in, in terms mm-hmm. of blocking Mark Andrews, you know, multiple games of, of great PFF grades and blocking. And then obviously Ricard and Kolar have, have been their kind of their main staple when it came to the primary rundowns there. Those guys are going out there and, and, you know, creating some holes. Right. They're going big again. Um, not as big as they were in 2022, but bigger than pretty much anybody else in recent NFL history. Again, um, they, they, they uh, were back up to 2.03 heavies per game. And I, I've often quote this thing is, the 2022 Ravens were at, I think, 235 for the year, which is just, it's so far the heaviest in recent memory. It's not even funny. And the highest otherwise were the 2019 Vikings, who were at 1.99. So just the, the Ravens kind of normal level of heavy now is just a, a, a smidge below where those 2019 Vikings were. And I think with the success of the run game, it's probably going to get heavier, not lighter. For sure. And we've seen, so the teams are obviously stacking the boxes against us and the Ravens are still running into it. I think they, I, I saw a stat earlier today on NFL pro that the Ravens are leading since 2021 of teams, uh, EPA running into, into stack boxes. So they're still seeing the stack boxes and they're still, they're still going into it. I, I don't think it's going to discourage them. And it, it's, it's, it's impressive. It is impressive seeing them. It's like, Hey, we're just going to keep getting bigger to your point. We're just going to keep getting bigger. Normally you, you have two choices against a stack box. You can, you can, you can misdirect or you can play point of attack and the Ravens amazingly can do both at the same time. So they can have, they can, they can actually, you know, pull sometimes in the opposite direction of where they're actually headed. And, and then they can still, you know, get the, get the left tackle out in space to block for, for, um, uh, Lamar, or they can, you know, hand it off on a jet sweep. They can follow that blocking. And then they have the point of attack game back with Ricard leading and, and, no matter how good you think you are at stretching that field horizontally, if you've got you know multiple big bodies, and we're talking about two pulling players and a and a, and a Patrick Ricard going after you, that's that's a very tough group to handle um, to, to not give up yards. So it's it's a it, you know I love seeing good running football. I know not everybody loves it. There seems to be a, a large contingent of Ravens fans who really believe 
it has to be by the pass or it'll never work in the playoffs. That's basically the, the words that are always used because they need to pull on somewhere where it hasn't worked. It's always worked in the regular season. So it can't work in the playoffs. And they are Lamar's two and four. So I'm right. You know, kind of thing. It's, it's, it's just, it's, I, I think it's silly, but it, but I do, uh, uh, I do think there's a large part of the, of the, um, uh, of the Ravens fan base who, who really either, either doesn't, doesn't like it because it's maybe not entertaining them to them or, or um, doesn't think it gives the Ravens the most options possible, which basically that part of it, I agree. You know, you want to have as many options as you can. For sure. You don't, you don't want to get too one dimensional and and where you lean. You always like the Ravens have for this, the, the majority of this early part of this year is they remain mostly balanced. You have the Lamar Jackson, 300 passing yard games. And you also have the Derrick Henry, uh, 200 rushing yard games almost. So they're, they're, they're playing a good balance between the both. I, I would say I'm, I fall more towards the, let's throw the ball more in the playoffs just because it's, it's, um, it keeps teams on their heels, especially now with Derrick Henry. It's, it's a whole, it's a whole, there's a, so, there's so many more opportunities and things we can play off of there. If once Derrick Henry gets going in a game, you, I mean, it's just, what what is the defense gonna do? What is the defense gonna do? You can't you can't crash against Lamar and read option. You can't crash against Derrick Henry. You gotta you gotta play you gotta play in space. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's very impressive to, to to see how we can we can continue to evolve as an offense. Yeah. Um, didn't take great care of the football at the start of this game. Now, obviously, Jackson didn't get a hundred percent of the blame in my opinion for the ball thrown to Andrews. Andrews probably could have knocked it down or even caught it. It was, it was called caught weirdly on the broadcast initially, you know, ball's caught. Oh no, wait, intercepted kind of thing. Uh, um, but it, you know, not a hundred percent his fault, but it wasn't a well thrown pass, but the ball was off target. And that was part of the problem in terms of getting that ball intercepted. I don't know whether it's 70% Lamar's fault or 50% Lamar's fault, but it's definitely not a hundred percent Andrews fault uh, that that occurred. That was that was a tough one. I mean, it's a tough grab to to make diving, but I, I was expecting Andrews with his prowess and and how how so many times in the past we've seen him get those balls and kind of clamp it to his hip and pull it down. I, I was hoping he would at least would have caught it or knocked it down. So, in terms of blame, you, you'd like to see the throw a little more a little more towards the chest, but it, it was a tough throw and and it was a tough catch as well. And it's just unfortunate that sometimes the way the ball bounces and you just you just got to move on and. And it is what it is. But in the moment, in the moment, I was upset that Andrews dropped it, though. Yeah. And the next drive, of course, ended with the weird fumble snapped off his foot, of his own foot, by by Linderbaum, which was one of the really weird ones. We've had some over-the-head snaps, which have probably been worse. This one was bad. It, it obviously, it could have been recovered by them. The Ravens actually recovered and got a field goal out of it, which at least is something. Um, but but not ideal. And and any time a third down opportunity is is um, messed up like that, uh, it's it's not a good thing. The, the fumbles are starting to get a, a little too much. I, it's been a constant theme uh, against the Bills. Henry and Lamar both fumbled. Lamar uh, with unless I'm misremember, misremembering the games with the like the leapfrog dive up mm-hmm. in the air and he you know the ball got popped out and I think they fumbled again last week or the previous week against the Bengals. So they're 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 getting by because their offense is so good, but those turnovers eventually they need to be cut out. The penalties and the turnovers they got to get cut out, mm-hmm. and it's it's it's, it's becoming uh, an issue that's getting put away because winning clears all and winning you know cleans all, but they got to fix it. That's that's exactly right. I mean, it's the ultimate kind of a, a window detergent or whatever you want to call it. But it, the 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 problem also rests with the defense because the defense is not converting their turnover opportunities. They're getting their hands on enough footballs, 29 passes defensed on the, on the year. Now, not all those that they have their hands on the footballs, but there's other ones where they've had opportunities for, for PDs for uh, interceptions as well, or, or, or fumbles for that matter. They've only had three interceptions to go with 29 PDs. That's extraordinarily unusual to have a ratio of 10 to one like that, or almost that 9.67, I guess in this case, um, it, all of the all the teams which are anywhere near their neighborhood in terms of PDs have more interceptions, and uh, you know they're they're seventh in the league in PDs and they're twenty fifth in interceptions and um, that, that's not seven, I think it's twenty fifth maybe I'm wrong maybe it's twenty third but but anyway they're way down there in interceptions and uh, not an acceptable combination they 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 they're get the the problem is in the hands right now and you know we saw we saw Wiggins Wiggins and now uh, uh, Ardarius Washington have problems the last couple of games. They ha- they have to convert. They have to convert on those. There there are plays to be made, and 
once we get later in the season and there's eventually better opponents that come our way, these games are going to Attention sports fans. Do you love winning? Of course you do. That's why you need to check out Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million members. And it's super easy. Just pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, sit back and watch the winnings roll in. How about a guaranteed win every week in September? Yep. Just one. That's just one. Caleb Williams passing yard gets you a win each football weekend this month. That's four weeks of easy W's. But don't sleep on it. This deal vanishes when September ends. But wait, there's more. Worried about injuries ruining your lineup? Relax. Prize Picks is the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy. If your player leaves the game in the first half and doesn't return, your lineup stays in play. No more stressing over those unexpected injuries. This weekend, I'm taking Derrick Henry for more than 70 yards and Daniel Jones for less than 193 passing yards. Two picks that I feel great about. And the best part is you can win up to 100 times your money with just four correct picks. So what are you waiting for? Download the Prize Pick app today and use the code RAVENS to get $50 instantly when you play just $5. That's right, $50 free just for giving it a shot. More winning, less stressing. Prize picks is where the fun begins. It come down to dropped interceptions, fumbles, and these small mistakes and, and missed opportunities. And our Darius Washington, I mean, that's you got to make that play. You got you to gotta make that play. Brandon Stevens as well. He's got to get his head around on some of these. I feel like on some of these, if he just if he just turns around, it's almost like a, a center fielder catching a fly ball. Um, and I think surprisingly enough, Marlon Humphrey is like leading our team in, in interceptions. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, he's yeah. I think he's it. So that that's bad. That's bad. Well, he's he's the best ball skills player we have right now, and and that's really that is unfortunate. We're saying that, but Marcus Williams obviously having a down year. He might be number one. Otherwise, Hamilton who is a great vulture in terms of picking up balls off the ground and whatnot, has recovered a fumble. You know, it was a really important one in the Buffalo in the, the Buffalo game during their comeback. Um, and, you know, what we haven't – Marlon has had a couple opportunities more that he hasn't converted. He had one really nice one on the on that right sideline. But uh, it, it's been a case where, you know, Wiggins obviously has been out there a couple times and, and has not, not been able to collect it and – the team, they have plenty of defensive playmakers. Most teams are not blessed with as many as the Ravens have right now. They're just not converting. Eddie Jackson was supposed to bring some of that. And he looks like he's uh, effectively lost his job with the second half of the last game. I mean, he was Ardarius Washington replaced him at strong safety. I heard, by the way, I did not hear Harbaugh's interview yet from yesterday because it's a busy analysis day for me. And so I didn't, I didn't get to it, but I heard that he, effectively said something about Ardarius Washington having more play at safety. Did you hear something? I'm 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 not a thousand percent sure because I'm I'm in the same boat where those these days yeah they get long and then I, I try as my best to 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 get all the horrible I can in, but sometimes it's too much. Do you, do you want to tell people what you do for a living? You don't have to if you if it's nah, not a good idea. Not yet, not yet. Not the time okay. isn't right. The time isn't right. All right, fair enough. Another time. Uh, anyway, uh, um, uh, let's see what else we got going on here. I, you know, one of the things that really came out of this game is it is, it was a take what you're given game, but even when they, when they're showing you a lot of men at the line of scrimmages, they did, and they rushed five and six a lot in this game, as we'll get to later in the, in the show. Um, what has to happen then is your guys have to get separation and really both flowers and Bateman did an outstanding job in separating versus man coverage. And they were, they were enormous. They combined for, I think, 205 yards in this one, 73 right for Bateman and 132 for, for flowers, I think. So uh, they, they were just amazing in terms of getting the separation. And, and they get it very differently. Uh, flowers is all about suddenness. And he gave Lamar a nice long look at him several times crossing the field, which was good. Bateman's Bateman is very much losing somebody at the top of the stem in more traditional route running fashion where that window is fairly short to get him the football, or it can be fairly short. Now, the commanders probably did him some favors and slipped on some of those plays and and created extra long windows for Lamar to get the ball because Bateman was still wide open at the catch point most of those times. And with Bateman, it it feels like most of the time with Bateman is that he's not – he's definitely – you have to have a lot more of like anticipation and where he's going type of thing, where Lamar prefers receivers that are more – 
more friendly and they'll stare you like the like they did. They'll stare him down. They'll they'll like, hey, I'm open, and they'll be very very adamant and clear about it. So with Bateman, he's a lot more concise with his routes and and the way he w- does things. Um, and a lot of the times in his in his route pacing, he doesn't get his head around as quick as some of the other receivers do. And he's also still, at least from what I've seen, more times than not, the second or the third read in plays. So still great production for him to go out there and put up his most yards he's put up in beers pretty much. And then Flowers as well, 100 yards and a half. When's the last time a Ravens receiver did that? Yeah. He's uh, he uh, I, I don't know the answer, obviously, but but that was uh, that was a great half of football. And Bateman is is surprisingly maybe sneakily having a having a very good year. He's he's at ten and a half yards per target right now. That's if you only get one stat for receiver, that's the one you want yards per target. Um, yards per route run is not bad either, but yards per target really gives you what you want in terms of the the, the combination of success on those on those plays, the, the total yards involved, and and how many he's getting per opportunity. Uh, that's just that's just exceptional. If he stays at this level, it'll be you know third, I think, in Ravens history. It might be second, even in Ravens history, in terms of yards per target for a season. So that'd be real exceptional. Mark Andrews holds the all-time record eleven point oh four in his rookie year. So uh, uh, you know he's he's having a very good year. And I, you know, I, I what you said earlier about Bateman was interesting because I think. I would not really put the blame on Bateman at this point. I think he's running his routes. He's getting free. All kind of separation metrics are pointing to him being pretty much open. I think the problem is basically that Lamar doesn't anticipate or like to anticipate throws well. And it kind of plays against what's really valuable about Lamar, which is extending plays and finding a receiver that's an easy pitch and catch where you know the break's been made and you know where that receiver will be. Um, with Bateman, if you throw that ball before he turns around, you've always got the risk that that the that the timing is not going to be perfect there. And Lamar, that's just not the kind of quarterback that Lamar is. Joe Flacco, he was that guy. Joe Flacco and Derek Mason had a had a great sense of exactly where they needed to be in terms of that sideline. Flacco very accurate in terms of getting the ball to him at a very high velocity. And uh, and uh, Mason did not disappoint on the on the on the receiving end. But it's just it's not the same kind of relationship that that Bateman and Lamar have. And um, some there is some of it is Bateman's responsibility for dropping a few balls into the hands of opponents for interception, but uh, I do put most of that blame on Lamar in terms of his style not really working with Bateman. For sure, and another thing we do see with Bateman, I would I would add is is that he's not at the catch point at the catch point he's going to get boxed out more by bigger and more physical corners. He's he's not a physical player mm-hmm. in terms of of trying to box people out, and it's understandable. He's not the, he's not you know six two. 210 pounds he's six foot about six foot one 180 190 so uh it, obviously he's played better give him his credit credit is due but when it comes to lamar and the way he does his reads it like bateman is probably in terms of the options on the offense option i would say number four in, in terms of uh, you got Henry option number option number one is Lamar always, always in my opinion Lamar is his biggest option option number two is 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 Henry option number three is is Flowers and then four would be some split between between Bateman and Likely but still don't want to take anything away from Bateman's performance I still still think he's performing well but I, I would say that my only pushback to what you are saying is that I agree their skill sets don't match up well at all but I would also say that. There's certain things Lamar likes to do, and there's certain things that Bateman likes to do, and it's just it's just it's just how football is. It's not an ideal match, yeah. All right, um, 145 yak in this game among 323 receiving yards. That's this is something that I think is a it's a good thing to be as variable as you can on this. But if you're going to only have one, I'd rather see low percentage yak games, and at 44.9 percent of the total receiving yards in yak, so 145 of 323 gross yards receiving. We're yak. Um, that's that's very good. That's that's a nice low number. Uh, the rest of the, the rest of the season combined was at fifty six and a half percent. And again, it's not like either one. You know, some offenses are pure screen offenses, and they're going to generate a lot of yak relative to the to the total receiving yards. In fact, you could have if, if you're a running back, it's very possible in a season. Ray Rice has done it before to have more yak than receiving yards. But 
it's it, it, when you see it and it's and it's just 45 percent. that means a lot of throws are getting made down the field they're getting you know good air yards and they're getting you know some yak hopefully on top of that as well but um i i really really like to see a number that low and uh, jackson had a great game in terms of, of being really on target uh in the 10 to 20 yard range yeah the the intermediate that that's the place that, that lamar works best and with flowers working over the middle like we said, the Bateman with that slant off the uh, off the backside, and <clears throat> Andrews as well. That that I mean, a- Andrews was wide open, and he got another like eight or nine yards of yak out of that. That Lamar kind of just threw it out there. But he also mentioned the screens, and and the Ravens have executed screens way, way, way better this year than they have in years past. You've seen that Zay Flowers tunnel screen, and some of the other screens they've ran with Justice Hill out of the backfield, and. The way the way they're blocking them and, and scheming them up is is yeah. um, a, a big reason, in my opinion, why the yaks probably went up a little bit. Well, you know that's a great point. We in our offensive line scoring, um, we'll go through this, and I can't even tell you how rare it is that the Ravens have had even two successful screen blocks on the same play in past years. It's just it's exceptionally rare, and some teams they really focus on on run blocking and getting to the right spot, making sure you know who you're going after. And, you know, as you burst past the line of scrimmage, exactly who you're supposed to hit. This is more than that. This is getting down and freelancing in space. And it takes it, it's a it's a different skill. Um, linemen get lungy downfield. They don't look right. Um, and if you see that, if you see a lion, lion, a lineman lunging downfield at a, at a safety or a corner as a smaller man just trying to avoid them. It's probably because they didn't have their feet set right. It's probably because they didn't approach that potential opponent. Uh, properly to reduce his options and then hopefully keep your feet as you're making your block. And the Ravens wide receivers and, and Isaiah likely they're tremendous at doing that properly. They're really good at keeping their feet as they block and maintaining blocks downfield. It's, it's really the linemen um, who, who, you know, for, for a long time in Ravens history have had trouble with that, but they're better. They're better this year. I think at, at getting downfield and, and making some blocks. Yeah. Ronnie Stanley working out in space. Yep. Akari as well. I mean, Four of the the offensive linemen are all good to exceptional level of athletes. Who, who, are you, <laughs> who are you excluding there? <laughs> yeah. Look, he does his best. He does yeah. his best. He's, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, those, those guys working out space, Rosengarten, and, and especially Stanley as well, I have to give him some big credit. He's he's come on and, and, and came back healthy, and he's, he's looking out there like he is, like used to in 2019. And then and Macari as well, being able to get out in space and at least be an athlete and, yeah. and, and work space. Uh, six out of 10 on third down. They now lead the NFL with 51.5%. They, they're trailing the commanders going into this commanders dropped in a second place and they're 48 and a half percent now, 48.6. Um, I, I, one of the interesting things was this red zone streak they had, and they had actually had an interception at the 20. And I just learned this, but that does not called in the red zone. It doesn't show up in the, in the NFL's red zone. You have to be inside the 20, which means you have to be anywhere between the 19 and the goal line. And uh, so that one didn't end it. But in the second half, they got they got taken to fourth down for the first time since the likely toe tap play in week one. So they had not been taken to fourth down in the red zone during that entire time. 18 drives in between that. They had 16 touchdowns and two field goals. That is just some incredible domination in the red zone. I mean, it's a, it's a spectrum. You can lose the football. You can lose it on downs. You can lose it on, on uh, a, a turnover. Uh, you can miss a field goal. I mean, you're, you're not guaranteed to score when you're inside the red zone. Even a field goal is a, you know, a participation trophy probably in terms of wh- where you, what you want from, from inside the 20, but at least it's something. Um, and both of their field goals had been not taken to fourth down. They were third and two at the end of the half. And then the um, overtime game winner, which is on first down, is strictly a risk mitigation technique that they'd be kicking at that point. It's it's the Derrick Henry effect. It's it's just so many teams are so so scared, so so scared of Derrick Henry just going in and, and, and pounding it in, and that they're just they're loading up the box, and the Ravens have their way. And like like I pointed out before, is that even the teams loading the box, the Ravens are still finding great success against it, but. You add in Derrick Henry running downhill. You add in Lamar Jackson. It's just there's it's a lot for teams, especially when it's condensed. The field's condensed. There's not as much space. You're you're kind of it's it's kind of a, a boxing match down there. And the Ravens more times than not win. Yeah, I I, I think you're right. I mean, I've always thought that Lamar Jackson was a special special weapon because he got you out of throwing any fade passes by 
running laterally along the line of scrimmage and finding a direct line of sight in order to make that pass. It goes back to some of the things you said earlier about Jackson in terms of really wanting to see the route break and have the open pitch and catch throw. Um, he's he was always good high in the end zone to to um, Andrews specifically, but also to likely on occasion. Um, and and you know so that's worked out. Flacco had a much lower set of honestly options when he was down in the red zone. He he liked to throw up the ball high between the goalposts, what, what a lot of people call zipper. Um, uh, try and have a player like Anquan Bolden come down with or or you know Pitta or others. Uh, but in terms of throwing to the outside, he threw a lot of fades, and it, it wasn't a, never is a really high percentage throw. For sure, and it's not, it's just not something that the Ravens are really set up for either in terms of an out an outside Anquan Bolden type of receiver, and it's not something that Lamar really goes crazy about throwing either. It's just it's it's something we re- we really haven't had a player with that skill set in order for that to really be something that they would lean on. Right. Right. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about Lamar and his game in this. There's, we, we mentioned the commanders really sold out against the run in this game that forced Lamar to throw the football. They actually did a very good job of containing Lamar as a runner. Lamar had the 133 yard run, which was designed, I believe, right? Yes, off right, uh, and went for 33. And then they, they held him to seven net yards otherwise. They had a minus five and a minus one in there, but uh, so it wasn't much. Um, he didn't break a bunch of big runs as a, as a scrambler, um, but. I thought there were some very interesting things that happened in this. One is the commanders used numbers in their pass rush. They didn't use deception. So I'm going over my sheet. And last week, the the, the, the pass rush column in here has all these 5-2, 4-3, 3-3, 4-3 kind of thing, 4-2. And what that means is the first number is the number of players who actually rush. The second are the number who drop from the line of scrimmage to cover. If you have two plus, that's called a simulated pressure. OK, and you can have one drop and some people would call that a simulated pressure, by the way. So I'm just telling you how I define it. Fifteen times they, the command, the Bengals dropped two plus from the line of scrimmage. The commanders did it zero times and they just watched the Bengals really hurt the Ravens because they only averaged five and a half yards per pass when they had, you know, a, 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 a simulated pressure on. So it surprises me that the, that the scouting didn't tell them to maybe try it differently. One of, one of the worst things you can do against the Ravens is just straight up play. I, I like that the Ravens will have a field day against your basic coverages where you're not simulating pressure, you're not doing anything with the blitzing. You're just you know you're going out there, you're playing quarters, you're playing cover two, you're you're sitting there in your shell. The Ravens will have a field day with that. They'll just go out there, they'll run play action, they'll they'll push the ball down the field. But when you start incorporating like the Chiefs you know, our kryptonite have incorporated with the the blitzing and the simulated pressures and the the man blitzing especially. Um, that's where you see the Ravens in the fire zone blitzing as well. That's where you see the Ravens start to struggle offensively and 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 the way they um, the way they process and they've been a lot better against the blitz this year. To your to your point about the Bengals blitzing last week and even though they didn't um, have the highest yards per pass, they still scored a lot of points. So. Commanders just that, that that was not that was not the formula if if they were looking for one. Yeah, it uh, nothing really worked for them when you get right down to it. I'm going to go through some numbers here, but we don't have to. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this. They, it, when they rushed four, they gave up 9.1 yards per play, despite the fact they had two sacks. That was on 16 plays. Ten times they rushed five, 138 yards, 13.8 yards per play, and two plays with six man rushing, 12.0 yards per play. There isn't anything in there that that it, that a defensive coordinator is going to say. Yeah, let me do more of that one. <laughs> it's they're all bad options, <laughs> so uh, it all really worked. When you t- when you otherwise try and layer the opportunity set, the Ravens gave Lamar Jackson. The offensive line had an above average game. They gave Lamar Jackson a fair amount of ample time and space opportunities. Ten in the game, thirty six percent. Now you guys listen to the show regularly know that the average is probably like twenty seven, twenty eight percent now of ATS opportunities, which means you get three seconds and the ability to step into your throw. Um, anyway, they were 7 of 10 on those throws. Uh, he was 7 of 10 on those throws for 121 yards, so 12.1 yards per play on those. When the ball was out quickly, 7 of 8 for 98 yards. That's 12.3 yards per play, so that's trouble also. And when he was pressured, this is really amazing, 36% of the time, again, he was 6 of 8 for 89 yards, 8.9 yards per play. And that included two sacks were both included in there. Uh just a fantastic day for Lamar in terms of working with that opportunity set he was given. For sure. And, and th- my biggest thing about the Ravens offense is 
I don't want it was funny the first couple of games this year they got into the check down. They were they really were checking the ball down. But when when you include Derrick Henry and the play action passing and the under center and all these things, my best inclination is hey, let's work the middle of the field and get these linebackers in conflict so they just can't come come up close to the line of scrimmage and be able to sit there in the A A yep. gap and, and try and play the run. So Lamar Lamar did his thing. He went out there, pushed the ball downfield, made some great throws, and it was it was it was just a, it was a very uh, let the things come to him type of game, and didn't panic against against some of those you know, pressures you even threw in there. So yeah, so so when they really did show seven or eight at the line of scrimmage a couple of years ago or three years ago in that Miami game, they, he saw that forty times, and that was a big problem for him. And he just he could not figure out how to decode that. They actually dropped men into the middle of the field. He didn't know what to do in terms of getting rid of the ball quickly or throwing over the the opposing defense, which is otherwise you know playing about six or seven yards off the line of scrimmage. So it was a big problem for him, and and it's it's great to see Lamar mature as a quarterback such that he knows what he's supposed to do. The other thing, I, I've talked about this on recent shows, but I'll mention it one more time, is that it's good to see Lamar walking up um, to the line of scrimmage pre-play and calling out new protections. So that's a really good thing for growth of the quarterback. First of all, it means he understands where the where the blitz is probably coming from, which means he probably understands where the hot is going to be coming, is going to be. So he, he has lots of, lots of, you know, thinking about it, even if he's, if all he was doing was talking to himself about that, sometimes you need to just, you ha- need to have someone there to bounce your ideas off of so you can hear yourself think, so you can work through a problem. It's almost like what Lamar walking up the line of scrimmage talking about protections is. You know, he just, he wants to be sure that he knows what he's going to see. And then he's, he's going to tell himself where he needs to, needs to go with the football. Anyway, mention the opportunity set 10 ATS, 8 BOQ, 10 pressures. Uh, Lamar outperformed that opportunity set by 140 yards. So his opportunity set was an expected one point, uh, sorry, 168 yards, and he actually threw for 308. Enormous difference, and all three, ATS, BOQ, and pressure, he was well above uh, the normal average. So uh, in total, I mean, th- at 28 opportunities, on average, he was five yards better than his expectation per pass, which is, that's otherworldly um burrow did that last week exactly by the way 140 did it on a lot more pass attempts so as a in a per pass basis it, it was less yeah that that is the the, the ravens offense always strives and it, it's uh something i know boss has been on here a couple of times we, we've debated is the the efficiency versus uh volume metrics and how 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 do you balance those two out and it's, it's impressive it's impressive to see them I, i've always leaned on hey if you if you want to pass the ball more and be more efficient at it, you're probably going to have to throw just a little bit more and, and, and work out those kinks in the offense. But you see here year two of Todd Munkin is, is uh, it's, it's running like a well old machine in, in the pass offense. I, you know, one of the things that always shows up in those next gen stats is that his expected completion percentage is usually like two to four points below normal 14.1 above expected uh, this time. I think that's a matter I have to believe this is a matter of having good success at intermediate levels where they probably put a significantly lower percentage of those. Down. And I don't know how they figure in with separation with other components of, of of what's going on, how they get to that expected completion percentage. But in any case, he well exceeded it this week. And, and uh, it, was, it was nice to see for a change because he's almost always a negative number in that category. For sure, for sure. And it's... It's just, it's just one of the, it was just one of those games. It was one of those games. It's great to see him. He's got what, like six hundred and fifty passing yards between the last two games, or something, something close to that. So it's, it's good to see. Uh, it's good to see the box score get filled up. It, it, it is. It's nice to be able to win in multiple ways, and they've, they've just, they have punished the opponents these last four weeks um, in, in various ways. You know, they ran the ball all over the Cowboys. They ran the ball all over Buffalo. They ran and passed all over the Bengals. And then they uh, really did the same thing again to the commanders um, in terms of, of, of being able to uh, stifle them. It's a very, very one-sided offensive game that, that was a lot closer because of some of the early turnover action than it really should have been. That, and, and that brings us back to the, the point I was making earlier. There's, there's going to come one of these games where you just can't keep giving the ball to the other team. And these offenses, uh, the way that they're scoring so quickly nowadays and, and the quick playmaking – you can shift the momentum of a football game off of one turnover, one fumble, or sometimes even one drive being killed by a penalty. 
so the, the Ravens, the Ravens have some things to clean up for sure. They're, 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 they're not in the clear offensively, um, especially with, and I know we'll get to it later is the, the offensive line. They've, they've certainly hidden a lot of the, uh, the, the warts of the offensive line with putting more blockers on the field and pass protection. And mm-hmm. it, it's, it's also a, a dual, 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 dual wielded sword, dual, dual, dual edged blade type of of thing. Where one, you need more blockers in the field to run, and it also gives off the impression you're going to run the ball if you have those yeah. heavy setter guys out there, and then that's where you build the play action off of it. But in terms of like pure drop back situations and, and going out there with five and perhaps protecting with five, you see them kind of st- stay away from that for the most part. And, and there is a playoff effect to each side of how they want to play running the ball and, and using those extra blockers off of passing and, and getting those out there in 12 and, and 21 personnel and what they've been doing. So there's there's certain aspects to it, for sure. All right, I want to talk about some other uh, elements of the skill position play here uh, for the last few minutes here. But uh, Derrick Henry, I guess the question I have about him, and he outsnapped Hill 43-26. This is the biggest, like, one-sided snap division that Henry has had the lead on this year so far. Hill's been playing just as many snaps pretty much the whole year, sometimes even a little bit more. And obviously Henry's getting the ball a lot more when he's in the game. He got it 24 out of 43 times a year. But there's still been zero carries for the third running back. Rasheen Ali was active here. Game script-wise, they were never at a point where the game was totally out of reach until they had they were on the final drive and got the, got the second first down that sealed the game. And then they could kneel. Didn't have it before then. So I understand why Ali might have never gotten into the game here. Are you concerned at all about Henry's workload and the need to manage that throughout the season? Or do you think he can get through a 17-game season averaging close to 20 carries a game? Derrick Henry's a freak athlete, and I, I just have to trust trust and, and hope that, that that his body will stay healthy. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change his workload unless the, the game script permits and, and they, they're – they're they're in a game where hey, we're up, or we we're up twenty eight to nothing at at the end of the first quarter type of thing. Where yeah, okay, let's let's get Justice Hill and the other running backs involved. But the the way that the Ravens operate, I'm I'm not I'm not too worried about the workload being an issue. Okay, all right, I I am a little bit, and I think that that I I think they do well to try and save him for the playoffs in part because running backs get hurt. And the, the, every carry is a is a small additional chance that it's going to happen, even to a back like Derrick Henry, who's who's been very resistant to injuries his whole career. Um, I, I, I'm concerned about it, but anyway, it's it's working out now. I'm just I'm not like a lot of things about what the Ravens do, like not having a fifth defensive lineman on the on the squad on Sunday. I don't like it on a risk adjusted basis. I can't really argue about it in terms of the results, but the strategy I would liken it to is this. If you go into a casino and you bet red on the roulette wheel and it comes up red, did you make a good bet? Did you make a good did you make a good risk adjusted bet? Because the answer to the first one can, can be yes, depending on how you view risk. The answer to the second one is definitely no. Because it's it's you know, you 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 expected to lose money on the bet. The actual result doesn't really matter. Um the, the risk adjusted return on 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 what you got is really what you have to be looking at and and i'm i just i don't feel on a risk adjusted basis that they've gotten value out of having only four defensive linemen active for these games and i think with henry they may be in a similar situation he is so extreme he is so much of a freak he's nolan ryan pitching in his 40s right now with still having a really top-notch fastball um that i don't know how to how to you know evaluate it differently Maybe I need a completely different set of aging curves to, to to think about what he what he might do in the future, but I'm still concerned about it. For sure, and, and that that is the argument of, of the running back in, in, in general is is that you don't usually go out and pay running backs a, a, a lot of money because they're so prone to injury. But two, and I'm I'm not a big fan of one offs and believing in one offs and you know putting a lot of faith and that into one offs. But every once in a while, there there are these these players and anomalies that come through and. Sometimes, sometimes you just kind of put a little bit of faith into him, and and I, I do I do understand where you're coming from, especially with you don't you don't want him going out there running 20 times a game because it is wear and tear on the body, and he is 30 and 31 or almost 30 31, so I, I certainly see the the point that you're making. I think uh, we talked about the heavies earlier, some and getting as many of they have on the field, and we're kind of running short on time here, but I wanted to 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 get your thoughts 
on Monken's ability to get Likely and Andrews on the field together. It really has not happened very often. You know, Andrews played 50% of the snaps and Likely played 68. I don't know if either of them, sorry, if both of them were off the field for any snaps. But what that means is there's only a maximum of 18% of snaps where they could have been on together. So a lot of the talk this offseason was about how, yeah, we're going to find all these different ways to get these two talented pass catchers on the field at the same time. Really doesn't work that way when they get down to scheme at football. So my, I was very adamant against against that going in the off season. It was there was no way that I saw that Likely and Andrews could get on the field at the same time, and for both them to get involved, it had to be one or the other. It had to be either Likely and Ricard, Likely and Kolar, or one one insert of Ricard and Kolar, and one insert of Andrews or, yeah. uh, or Likely. It can't be both at the same time. So. It's it's this is playing how to how I thought it would play out. It's it's not surprised to me because it's just it's just it's not feasible to have two tight ends who are somewhat similar in terms of how they play and where they line up and they both like playing in the slot and they both like working over uh, the way they work routes and and how they create leverage off defensive. They're just they really are very similar players. So it, it it's no surprise to me at all. Okay. Well, anyway, it's 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 certainly been something that um, really begs the question of: Is there any way to keep Mark Andrews next year? I mean, he's he's one of the big cut dollars options the Ravens have, and along with Marcus Williams, those two between them, I think, are, are can generate something like seventeen million of total available uh, cap dollars. The Ravens are desperately needed in not only to um, uh, to deal with a you know some cap deficiency, but also to to be able to create contracts for a lot of their guys who are just coming up. I mean, they've Owe and Likely and Linderbaum and and you know potentially even Stevens. Uh, the boat has probably sailed on that. Um, and then uh, there's one I'm forgetting here, Travis Jones. I mean, they're huge names on the team. A year removed, it's going to be Hamilton. I mean, they've got all these guys they've got to sign. They're not going to be able to go out and get wide receivers. So you just cut that noise out right now. In terms of next year, they've got a bunch of their own players they need to sign, and they've got a chance to sign them cheap. But the only way they can sign them cheap is if they have the money available when these guys are just coming out of their third year instead of just coming out of their fourth. For sure. And I, I'm – so Andrews has played – last game was Andrews' best game by far. Mm-hmm. I'm still – I'm in the boat where if you, if you can find return on Andrews and some sort of – trade value return or some sort of pick swap return or even a player player swap return where you think it'll benefit your team more. I, I would probably explore that avenue because Mark Andrews, without a doubt, is probably the Ravens well, depending on how you feel about Todd Heap, probably the Ravens best tight end of all time. He just he just had the records uh, broken the other day. So he he certainly you know, in terms of Ravens legend and all that stuff, he, he fits the bill. But the Ravens do need do need cap space. They do need to be able to make moves and even just to sign the practice squad. And I mean, they're, they're so close to the cap already next year that it, it's going to come down to the Ravens probably making a tough decision like that. Yeah. It's it, it, you, the trade idea is a good one and they could trade him in season this year, maybe, but that's um, then they have to, they have to do some things to move money around. Doesn't it, doesn't make it a bad thing. It's just accelerating money that they, they would have to do. But the other possibility is they could trade him next year at the, at the draft, at the time of the draft. And they won't have had to made their decision on whether or not they're going to keep him or not. Actually, may have a roster bonus that would kick in before then. But they could they could trade him around around the um, uh, the first of March if that's the time they have to make the decision on a bonus and get something for him for the draft. And and it, if they're going to cut him anyway, you know maybe there's a fourth round pick out there that's that someone wants to give you for Mark Andrews. He's actually a real bargain at what he's going to make next year. I mean. If Mark Andrews plays like he has, okay, if he plays at 75% of where he's been the last few years, let's say, um, or, you know, certainly if he played like he has the last couple of games combined, one good, one bad, um, his base salary for next year, for 2025, is only $7 million with a roster bonus of $4 million. So there's a total of $11 million um, that somebody has to pay. That's an incredible bargain for Mark Andrews in today's tight end market. And then whoever has him, it's going to be one of the teams that has a lot of cap money to spend. They'll sign him and they'll, they'll have him for years. And that, that may be an option to get a player who, um, you know, is not normally available to a team that doesn't draft very well. 
For sure. And it's, it, it is unfortunate that it is a, an avenue the Ravens will have to explore, but there is, the reality is, is they have, they have, they're, they have really good tight ends behind them that are, that are making less and they're more cat friendly. Yeah. All right. Uh, Fantastic. We, I, I think we've we've gone through what we need, what we can in this first part of the show, and we'll have Yuri back for the second part of the show uh, to talk about the offensive line, talk about some individual player performances, and get to the mailbag. Yuri, tell folks where they can talk football with you online. Yeah, so I'm on X, or formerly known as Twitter, Yuri underscore Ravens. Uh, I have a podcast that is periodically uploading videos, Ravens uh, Ravens Way podcast uh, on YouTube, and then every Wednesday around nine fifteen Eastern. Me and Huddle Up Films are going live, doing just more Ravens, more Ravens content, talking, uh, talking the previous game, talking the next one, looking at some matchups. So, all over social media, you can find me. All right, outstanding. Really appreciate you making time for this, Yuri. Other folks out there, if you can, um, and you're interested in doing a film study short, hit me up with your idea. DMs are always open on Twitter. I'll respond to you very quickly. We'll talk through your idea. It's in the same way I appreciate getting mailbag questions from you folks. I appreciate new ideas for content. And even though I do about nine shows per week, there's always time for a short. In particular, we have a long week here. We have bye week. We have you know some Thursday to, to the following Sunday kind of, kind of breaks where there'll be longer opportunities for content. I will find a way to get your show idea in there, and I want to talk to you about it. Yuri, thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.